In the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'd like to tell you our experience of using Toshiba's latest Doppler technology, SMI, uh, and how useful it can be in a clinical setting. Uh, Professor Hata and Professor Fisher has already talked about the technology behind SMI, so I will be skimming through this very quickly, and would like to draw your attention, really, to its applications in small parts and musculoskeletal imaging, where I think it has a large clinical application. And then I'd like to show you where I've also found ab uh, where it's useful in abdominal organs. And then, finally, I'd just like to update you on our trials and tribulations of detecting the central lymph node by an intradermal injection of microbubbles. So, as we've seen in the last two talks, SMI really utilizes filters and an algorithm which reduces clutter, and by doing so, improves the visualization of low-velocity flow vessels. From a technical aspect, if you've seen some images, we would favor the monochrome SMI rather than the color-coded version, not only uh, because the monochrome is more sensitive, uh, and that you can also put it into twin view and visualize where it is in B mode. And you'll see from some examples I'm going to show you that this dual cursor in the monochrome version is extremely useful. So here is an example of a lymph node, it looks pathological on B mode in a patient with a head and neck cancer uh, uh, within the neck. And when we turn on power Doppler, as expected, it's a little bit more vascular than we would see. Here it is in ADF again. But when you turn on monochrome SMI, so that the B mode version is on the left here, and here it is on the right, what you don't appreciate with the two Doppler techniques is this meshwork of neoantigenic vessels around this pathological lymph node. When you switch over to the color-coded version, you also get this impression, but perhaps you might appreciate more of these branching vascular pattern a little bit better with SMI. Now, how does it do with a small lesion? Here is a testis with a three millimeter lesion. The scale here is zero to one. And as you turn on power Doppler, you seem to get a great influx of power and the whole lesion looks vascular. But when you turn on SMI, then you get the impression that there are the fine macrovascular network around this vessel and some of it going into it. But what's important is when it's so small, you're not sure where you are, and here it is, the cursor matching that of your B-mode appearance. So something we found extremely useful was to have this dual cursor in the B-mode and monochrome version. Again, another example where uh, SMI can be extremely useful in this patient with a uh, collection within the skin with some pointing to the dermal layer, it looked like a sebaceous cyst. Is this uh, infected? And then when you turn on SMI, you can see the soft tissues around it, markedly vascular, confirming that this sebaceous is, is infected. But what I really like to turn to now is this use for musculoskeletal imaging, looking at tendons and joints. And I'm going to allow the imaging to do uh, the talking here. So here is an example of a patient with cirrhotic arthritis Within the talonavicular joint, within the foot, you can see synovial hypertrophy, but the question is, is it active synovitis? Here, as I start the video clip of the power Doppler, you can see that it is very vascular, but the fine meshwork you appreciate much better with SMI. Here's another example of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, and this is the extensor surface, the extensor tendon, and on the B mode image, you can already see that there is irregularity to the distal radius and some synovial hypertrophy. And is this active? Well, when you turn on power Doppler, you do get an appreciation that there are some vessels flowing into this uh, inflamed area. But this has becomes much more apparent when you turn on SMI, you can actually see a vessel diving and this branching network pattern which you appreciate much better with SMI. But the question is, the clinical question is, what about the low-grade inflammation that we do not 
normally detect. So there are a lot of patients who come to us to, uh, and the clinical question is, is there an active synovitis? And a lot of the time, if we don't see anything on power Doppler, we say, no, there is no active synovitis here. But let me just show you some examples where SMI may change your clinical findings. Here is an example of a patient who complained of knee pain on the medial aspect. And what we have here is the patella tendon attaching to the tibia. And this is the site where he complained of tenderness. When we turned on power Doppler, there's not much to see on B mode and not much to see on power Doppler either. But here you go, watch what happens when we turn on SMI. This is the region of interest to watch. Suddenly you see this mesh work of extra vessels indicating that there is extra vascularity in this portion of the tendon and a tendonitis. So I was confident to give this patient a steroid injection uh, into that region. Here's a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, and already on the B mode within the sternoclavicular joint, you can see synovial hypertrophy. The question is, is there active synovitis here? The patient complain of symptoms. And you can see some blooming on the power Doppler because we're just turning up the gain as much as we can to see whether there is uh, any blood flow. So here on this image, you can see perhaps some vascularity around the edge of the uh, uh, joint itself, but when we move on to SMI, what you clearly appreciate are these vessels flowing right into the joint which you couldn't appreciate with power Doppler. So showing us that there is some increased uh, blood flow within this synovium hypertrophy. The last example I wanted to show you was this patient who has an inflammatory arthritis who complained of pain in the thumb, and uh, this is the First, carpal metacarpal joint. Again, you can see synovial hypertrophy, but really not much to see with power Doppler. And then, when you turn on SMI, you can actually see these abnormal blood flow flowing into this thickened synovium, showing that there is some low-grade activity within this joint itself. So the question is, is SMI better than power Doppler? And to do this, uh, we analyze uh, patients who presented for musculoskeletal ultrasound scan complaining of pain either within the joint, tendons, or a palpable lump. And to be included in this analysis, they, uh, their imaging had to have one of the following, following inclusion criteria. Either they, you saw something on B mode, either synovial hypertrophy, or you picked up signal on power Doppler, or signal on SMI, or a combination of that three. Then myself and uh, my colleague David Cosgrove assessed each lesion individually and scored in consensus the videos and still images. So far, we've looked at a total of approximately 40 joints and tendons and soft tissue lumps. And here are the results. Here is where SMI shows a signal within either the joint or tendon or in the lump, and where power Doppler shows a signal. And in 24 of those cases, we saw a power Doppler signals on both. In three cases, power Doppler was negative, and so was SMI, but the importance here was that there were 13 cases where power Doppler is negative, but you're picking up the extra low-grade flow within patients with a known arthritis or tendonitis that you could only see with SMI. And if you did a statistical analysis on this small group already, then it's already statistically significant. When we saw a Doppler signal on power Doppler and SMI, we then had a, gr a grading score from zero to uh, three to score this, whether it was bet SMI was better than power Doppler, and if so, was it mildly better, moderately or markedly better, and you can see in only four cases, we felt that it was no better than power Doppler, and in the majority of cases, more than half nearly, that it was moderately or markedly better than power Doppler. So, in 13 patients, we were able to detect vascularity only seen with SMI, and this changed the clinical management either by direction of injection of steroids or starting disease-modifying drugs. And in the majority of patients, we felt that the, when there was signal, then SMI did a little bit better than power Doppler. This has a huge clinical impact because we are now for the first time able to 
detect this low-grade inflammation of joints in patients with a known arthritis who complain of tenderness, but if we don't de detect it, anything on power Doppler, we used to send it away saying that it is inactive, but perhaps we are showing some low-grade activity now only detectable by SMI without the need for ultrasound contrast. And of course, this has clinical implications for early detection and treatment of disease, as well as uh, influencing their prognosis and their prediction of relapse. I've just outlined a lot of papers here looking, uh, suggesting that Doppler ultrasound is much better as an indicator for picking up uh, activity compared to MRI in small joints. Uh, and in many of the rheumatology journals, you'll find these uh, publications. So turning over to what about how useful can it be within the abdominal organs? And here are some potential applications. Here is a patient with a fatty liver. And already on B mode, you have a hypoechoic area. And it could just be an area of focal fat. What would confirm it for us would be to see some vascularity and blood flow flowing through this area with no distortion. And as I play the clip, there was no flow at all on power Doppler. But when we turned on SMI, you can clearly see some blood vessels flowing through this area on SMI itself, confirming to us that there was no distortion of blood vessels and this was just a fatty liver. Again, here is an example very similar to that shown by Professor Harta, a patient with cirrhosis and a lesion. Already, clinically, we think this is going to be an HCC. If you turn on power Doppler, you can see that this is a rather vascular lesion. But, surprisingly, you see the meshwork of basket weave pattern, and this is without contrast of this hyper. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which you probably wouldn't appreciate just without power Doppler. And here it is again. Of course, because we rely on contrast, we gave contrast to show the avid arterial enhancement of this lesion in the arterial phase. Here it is, and there's the time. And you can see as this lesion enhances, you get the impression of that basket weave pattern, but perhaps not as clearly as you do with SMI, and this just confirms that this is an HCC. What about if you have a patient with no known chronic liver disease and you find a subtle hypochoic area, not much to see with power Doppler, and when you turn on SMI, here's the heart beating away, you can actually get to see a meshwork of pattern within this lesion itself, and perhaps it has that slight spoke wheel appearance. Of course, we gave contrast again to confirm its nature, and here it is in the arterial phase, when we're just moving that cursor away to look at this arterial enhancement, you will see a feeding vessel, here it is, from the center of this lesion, and it enhances from the center outwards, confirming that it is focal nodular hyperplasia. Quite important and quite useful if you had a solid renal lesion and wanted to know whether it is vascular. Here is a renal lesion with no vascularity seen. It's solid appearing on power Doppler. But when you turn on SMI, you get to see marked vascularity within this lesion itself. So here it is a vascular renal lesion, or again, vascularity detected only with SMI. And here is the confirmation with contrast. You can see a hypervascular enhancing lesion within the kidney with an area of necrosis, so renal cell carcinoma. Now contrast this to this apparent solid lesion, again within the kidney, slight calcified rim. Is this a solid tumor? Well, when you turn on SMI, then there is no flow within it. But you would like to confirm that with some contrast. And here it is, an enhancing kidney and absolutely no flow within this lesion itself. So what is this clinical impact within the abdomen? Well, we can detect now some low flow within focal liver lesions. I think it's important when you see a hypervascular or vascular lesion in the lesion, it's important to distinguish whether there's a background of chronic liver disease or an underlying malignancy, and that will influence what you do. And also, importantly, correlate with grayscale appearance. 
However, it is the hallmarks of contrast enhancement, the time enhancement, the wash-in and wash-out, which uh, we rely on to characterize focal liver lesions. I think it probably is slightly more useful for solid renal lesions, where it doesn't matter about the time and or wash in or wash out, but whether it is a vascular lesion or not, because any vascular lesion will probably need some form of intervention uh, within the kidney. And of course, the question that perhaps you're all asking now is, can it avoid the need for contrast enhancement? Well, I think that can't be answered yet, but I'd like to just leave you with this example, again, of a patient with known malignancy, but a fatty liver and a geographically shaped hypochoic area, and it's actually brought back because there was a low-density region seen on CT and they weren't sure what it was. When you turn on the power Doppler, you can actually see nice some vessels running through this, and you probably might be reassured that this is focal fat. SMI, lots of vessels running through that area, so perhaps focal fat. There it goes again. But when you give contrast, and you can see here it is in the late phase, within that area of focal fat, something washes out a small metastasis within an area of focal change. So when you see some of the images in the near field, there is some slight limitation in that there is breakthrough, and the echogenic structures, particularly in the near field, will show uh, on the SMI image, some uh, increased enhancement. And it is here that the dual curse is extremely useful for you to distinguish between what is true vessel and what is an echogenic linear structure. And in this case, real-time clips are really essential for assessment. And case within the abdomen, then sometimes cardiac pulsations and breathing can lead to some marked image degradation. So in conclusion, for SMI, superb microvascular imaging has much better sensitivity than power Doppler. The vascular pattern and the microvasculature is much better delineated. And where I think it will have a strong clinical potential is that of detecting low-grade information not previously possible without contrast or on power Doppler uh, in the setting of an arthritis or tendonitis. It also has potential abdominal applications, perhaps more so with those of renal masses where it is uh, important to know whether it is hypervascular or not. Just turning over before we close the last few minutes of looking at our trials and tribulations of detecting the central lymph node in patients with breast cancer. So it is important for their staging, and it, we were based on a technique developed by Dr. Ali Siever where you inject some microbubbles, a small volume, 0.5 to 1 mil of Sonovu in the periolar region intraderminally, and find to see whether you can detect the first node that it drains to. Dr. Siever does this very well, but it perhaps isn't as easy in practice, and in our experience, what key thing is to optimize your scanner settings for the low mechanical index uh, probe using an S704 SBT. So here is an example of what you can see after you've optimized the settings and an intradermal injection. And here it is, is the contrast within the skin. It takes a little while to get your eye in, but here is just the grayscale. If you follow this vessel <coughs> lymphatic itself, you can actually see it dip down and then suddenly run deeper. And of course, you will then be more reassured when you see it dip down and flow into a lymph node, identifying that this is the central lymph node. Of course, it can have a slightly tortuous pattern, and here it is. After injection, close to the skin, it's amazed how superficial it is, and then suddenly it seems to double back on itself, but again, the key thing here is that it appears to flow with evident enhancement within a lymph node. So for our results so far, well, we've had over the, our trials and tribulations about 30 cases to date, and 24 of them were successful. The first few, we didn't uh, manage to get any drainage uh, at all or visualize the lymphatics very well. But since then, we have had two cases which were confirmed as uh, metastasis at uh, biopsy, then after excision and uh, operations, then these were confirmed as true positives. 
We did, however, have several false negatives where we said that these were negative central lymph nodes, but at operation, there was malignancy within them. But interestingly, three out of the four only had isolated tumor cells or micrometastases, i.e. less than one millimeter. And I think that's an important finding. Of course, one did have a micrometastasis, and the rest of the cases were true negatives. So what is clinical impact? Well, it can save a patient an extra operation if you can detect and percutaneously biopsy the central lymph node. It saves them having an excision biopsy. However, uh, in the larger series that uh, published by Dr. Siva to date, out of his 35 positive biopsies, they did detect 17% micrometastasis. And why is this important? Because the literature coming through is that the indication that if there is a micrometastasis within a lymph node from a patient with breast cancer, then axillary clearance isn't indicated. The survival is as good as uh, not if it is just micrometastasis. And perhaps by detecting this, we push over the problem to our histopathologists, whether in our sample, if it is truly malignant, how big is that sample within our core biopsy itself? So some food for thought there. So in conclusion, it is certainly feasible for to detect the central node percutaneously. Key here is the optimization of your high frequency setting and a particularly essential in ensuring success to detect the central lymph node. But of course, multi-central trials are much needed to validate this technique and its clinical impact. With that, I'd just like to thank my uh, colleague, David Cosgrove, uh, for helping with all this work, and also the engineers at TMSC Japan and the ultrasound team at TMS Europe. Thank you very much for your attention.